Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the International Affairs Forum, back in a nice, sunny, warm, Traverse City evening. And uh, we want to thank this great crowd for coming out on uh, what is uh, certainly one of the hardest uh, evenings we've had. Uh, I think we're in for a special treat. Uh, we, our, our guest tonight is uh, unique and new and uh, uh, new to Traverse City, but uh, she's been living uh, in Boston. She's at Harvard, and so uh, she came here to escape from the snow. Um, That's true. She is, uh, as you have seen from the handout, uh, a professor at the University of Havana, Cuba. She is a blogger. Uh, she is uh, a very dynamic and interesting young woman, and she will give us a perspective about Cuba that I think it's unique to be able to have that perspective at this particular time when our policy is, um, is changing. Uh, and, and not clearly how, it's not entirely clear how uh, it's changing, but, um, uh, and that will somewhat depend on the Congress. We'll have a, a, a chance to uh, listen to Elaine Diaz Rodriguez, uh, and then you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So I'd like you to have those in, the, in your mind uh, and think about what you would ask uh, uh, here, this great opportunity, a real live Cuban. Uh, what do the Cubans <laughs> think about us, and what do the Cubans think about what's happening in our relationship? So ladies and gentlemen, please, give a very warm welcome to Elaine Diaz Rodriguez. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Can we have the presentation? It's over there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Technical problems, so usually in Cuba. <laughs> so I must confess that I'm really grateful to you guys for giving me the perfect excuse to leave Boston. <laughs> this is a wonderful and beautiful and warm weather compared, compared with two feet of snow in Boston every day. I have been at home three days in a row, and I didn't know what to do because I lose also my internet. It's like, it's, it's, it's a kind of Cuban curse not to have internet. <laughs> so, when I nobody has trouble with internet in Cambridge, just me, I think it's personal. <laughs> when I received the invitation to come here to the International Affairs Forum, I did, I did what, what uh, all the people do on this internet web of life. I Google it. And I was scared. I was scared because I was looking at those pictures of tremendous accomplished professionals coming here to talk to you in this huge scenario. So when I was invited to come here to talk about Cuba, time for a change, it started way before December 17. And I think that was personal too, because I have this great presentation on what Obama should do, should do next to improve the relationship with Cuba on November 24, and then he did it. <laughs> and I had no conference to, tell, to, to, to talk, so I was like, loose. I was like, what am I going to do next? So I think now is a perfect time to talk about Cuba. As I said before, I was really scared when I received this presentation. I must tell you, I'm not a Cubanologist. What is a Cubanologist? A person that can talk about economy, politics, internet, education, healthcare, environment, and everything about Cuba. I'm just a journalist. I'm not an expert on every single detail of my country, and I have spent the last six years as a professor at the University of Havana, and as a journalist. 
I was lucky enough that six years ago, Cuba and my university in specific, they wanted us to teach students about digital journalism and journalism on internet. And they say, we need to bring young people because they know how to work on computers. So let's hire a lot of young, young graduate, uh, people recently graduated, and we are all set. And I was lucky enough to receive a proposition from my university. So as soon as I get graduated, I start teaching to students one or two years younger than me. That's pretty scary. <laughs> so I have been mostly writing about internet in Cuba, so I cannot predict the future of Cuba. If you want, to me, if you want me to do that, I cannot do it. But what I really can do is talking about the most challenging issues we have been facing right, or we have been facing and we are facing right now from a deeply personal perspe perspective. Some of you have seen pictures of Havana. It's this beautiful city located just 90 miles away from the southern point of the United States. It's this small and tiny country. One friend of mine, before Obama reestablished the diplomatic relationship with Cuba, he used to say, the main problem between Cuba and United States is that Cuba is a small country with huge pride. And United States is a huge country with a huge pride. <laughs> and when that two countries want to talk, it's really, really, really hard because nobody wants to lose anything. So I was born in this small country 29 years ago. Not exactly here. I was born in this small place called Campo Florido. Campo Florido is 20 miles away from the main city, from the main part of of Havana. It's, may, it's a fairly large area where people that, the people that live here, they are children of farmers or grandchildren of farmers or farmers. It's mostly, it's mostly composed by uh, farmers. My grandfather came to live here after the triumph of the revolution and he received this large amount of land with nothing to do on, on it. And he started a family there and we grew up there 29 years uh, ago. He most, uh, most done, done that. So almost 10,000 people live in this place, in Campo Florido. And I was really, really lucky because on, unlike the experience from people of the city, I grew up with these two guys as my best friends. So every time I look out of my window, there was this beautiful and peaceful last landscape. I wasn't even born in 1959. My mom wasn't born, born either. My grandpa and my grandma were re very, very young. In the book Back Channel to Cuba, I strongly recommend you to read, the author says that on April 16, 1959, there was a launch in Washington. Fidel Castro met the acting secretary of state, Christian H. A. I. Herder. During the launch, William Wyland, the director of the Office of Caribbean and, Mexi and Mexican Affairs, was introduced to Castro. And he said, this is the State Department official in charge of Cuban affairs. To which Fidel replied, I, I thought I was in charge of Cuba affairs. And the author said, that was a clever joke, but it was full of symbolism. And I think for more than 50 years, US representatives and politicians have acted as if they were in charge of Cuban affairs. I have never seen the snow before coming here, before November 24th. It was beautiful by then. I remember I was having coffee in this uh, Charles Hotel with an author called Donna Hick. Donna Hick has this wonderful book on dignity and how dignity can play a role in conflict resolution. He has been working in Colombia, in Israel and Palestine, and in a lot of countries. And she said, we should do a conference on how can dignity play a role in the conflict between Cuba and United States. And she asked me to, asked me to share the conference with her. And I, of course, said, yes, of, this is a great opportunity. And that afternoon, it started snowing. So I think all these years, we have been uh, 
following this conversation between Cuba and United States, and now for the first time we have seen something really improving in that field. And I think it's because we have been uh, having this conversation respecting the dignity of each other and in a pretty honest uh, ways. In 1990, it, it starts snowing, and I put my flag on the, <laughs> on the window. How patriotic is that? In 1990, I was five years old. For you, the, I don't know how familiar are you with the Cuban crisis, but I don't remember the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was five years old. But I still remember what we call the special period, which, by the way, was not a special and not just a short period at all. Cuba maintained the 85% of its trade relation with the Soviet Union and the rest of the socialist camp. In practical terms, it implies that most of our clothes, food, technological supplies, and everything else but sugar came from the Soviet Union at highly subsidized price. So people still remember the collapse of the Soviet Union and the special period as the there is nothing era. There is no food, there is no clothes, there is no public transportation, there is nothing. You don't have even anything to uh, eat in, uh, during this period. And some people make fun of it, and it says now that it's so uh, in, the, in the public debate, that the real Hunger Games took place in Cuba during the special period. And look at way less fancy than what you have been watching at uh, TV. My family, of course, and all my friends didn't escape the economical crisis. My mother, with her salary as a teacher, for example, could never fi finish building our house. I only remember two pairs of shoes from first to sixth grade. And this is the story of all the people of my, almost all the people of my generation. But my grandfather always said, we had the most wonderful gift in the world, which is the land. He came to Havana after the revolution, and he received this small and poor house in the middle of nowhere, and he turned it, turned it on into a wonderful home for my grandma, my mother, my, and my uncle. Thanks to the land, my family never starved during the 90s, and that's the way everybody was escaping from the crisis. Some people have land, some people have other ways to escape from that. So my family always teaches something really important. We came out from the, from the crisis with, uh, I think, strong principles. So almost everybody was trying to survive during the uh, 90s, but not everybody did it in the same way. Stealing from the state became a common practice, and it was called to survive, or sobrevivir in, in Spanish. You can steal whatever you want from the state in order to survive during the 90s. So it becomes a state where corruption was so generalized that even nobody sees it as a wrong practice or anything else. No matter what you stole, pencil if you were a school teacher, medicines if you were a pharmaceutical, cement if you were a mason, or even the old seats of the train abandoned if you were working in this place. You could always trust, and you can always trust now in Cuba, that you will find anything in the black market. And anything you steal, you will find a way to resell it in the black market. From my day with my grandfathers and from the 90s, we as a generation and a lot of people I know, we learn something important. Honesty and hope. I didn't know how the, unless I read the history books, I didn't know how the conflict between Cuba and United States started. I wasn't even born. I have read in the books, but I didn't experience. What I do experience was the 90s and the people leaving the country in rafts. One of those rafters was an uncle. And I don't know how to, when I start, the things I have been making up in my mind and the things he already told me. But I still remember that he used to say, he's in, living in Miami now, he used to say, we left the food in the sand. We forgot about it. And we were in the sea with water and honey for more than seven days. And we survived. And when we were about to die, 
these American people in the, in the, the Coast Guard, they took us and I arrived to America in 1994. For most of the Cuban people living in the island, America is not this strange country with McDonald's and with people who speak English. It's the country where we have almost two million of Cuba, or Cubans, or people descending from Cubans, Cuban from the first, gener first generation, Cuban from the second generation, and cousins, sisters, family. When you go to Cuba and you talk to someone in Cuba, you will see a lot of family story. People who came through the Mariel port, people who came during the Peter Pan operation, people who sent their sons to live the, here, their daughters, people who came throughout the border of Mexico and the border of uh, Canada. And we believe and we grew up believing that America was this evil nation in the country. That's what we learned from television. So in Cuba, for example, three out of four Cubans believe that one of them, that three of them out of four, belongs to the state security. And when you know an America, Cuban people think that three out of four Americans works for the CIA. <laughs> so I was watching this interview to Josefina Vidal. Josefina Vidal is the woman who is conducting the uh, conversation, to conversation between Cuba and United States in Cuba. And I still remember this journalist, and he asked her, do you trust in United States now? And she keep avoiding the lesson. We have this class on Harvard called How to Make a Politician. And they, the first day, in the first class, they said, you need to avoid the tough questions. And I will show you how not to answer to the press. <laughs> and when I was looking at Josefina Vidal that day, and this journalist asking, do you trust in United States? And she avoiding answer the question. I was like, oh my God, she didn't went to Harvard. When did she, <laughs> when did, when did she learn that? But I was also really happy because I was expecting, she said, no. There's no way we can trust the United States, which is the previous discourse about it. So I noticed a change on the discourse. So this day, I believe that things are going to be uh, so much better now. And this distrust and this uh, no confidence in, in, in each other will change in a short or even in a, in a more longer uh, period of time. There is another person who was really, really important on this uh, conversation, the Pope. When you talk about Cuba, we are, we are, talking with, we are dealing with a country with a minority, a Catholic minority. We are not talking about a country with a huge Catholic community. But the Cuban Catholic Church has an enormous influence in Cuba. It was the main play, uh, the main actor in the conversations between the government of Cuba and Spain back in 2010 to release more than 70 political prisoners. And it's been playing a huge and important role in the conversations between Cuba and United States. That's why when we received the notice that the Pope has been working on, with Cuba and United States, that they put them together to talk about how to reveal the diplomatic relationships, how to reveal a broken relationship, it was not a surprise for us. So during the last 18 months, the government of Cuba and United States using back channels were discussing several issues and they came up with this beautiful announcement on December 17, 2014. I remember I was in Miami. And what a cliche. I mean, all the Cubans came to Miami on the, on the holidays. I was, I was in Boston, and then I fly to, to Miami on, on December to see my family. And I remember we were about to leave the home, but because we, had, we have to meet some people. And I remember someone told me, when we see the news that CNN and everybody was like, Obama and, Fid and Raul Castro will make a public statement about their relationships. I remember my cousin told me, I think you should stay home. And I was like, no, why? And she said, this would be something huge. And you are a journalist. And you deserve to be here. And you deserve to be paying attention to the television and not in a silly meeting with a lot of uh, people. And then I was alone at this 
place in, in Homestead, which is really far from all the fancy places on, on Miami. And when I saw President Obama coming to, the, to talk, I started crying because I didn't know what he was going to say. And, and I was expecting so much. And I started crying, I started crying because I feel so much relief in this second. I remember I posted the picture on, on, on Twitter and all the media of course republished it because they want so much drama and someone crying is so good for the media. And then I was like, oh my God, we, we have been waiting this since forever. We are young professionals in Cuba who has a lot of family living here in the United States and we want to fix this. We do not hate, as Cubans, American people. We love American people. We watch your shows. We know everything about Orange is the New Black. We know, I don't, we know everything about House of Cards. <laughs> All the Cuban kids have been watching Game of Thrones since forever. And we actually start to celebrate Halloween. <laughs> so, for Cuban people, the American culture is not something strange. We feel more related to America than we feel related to Latin America. Some, 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 sometimes we listen the same music, we have the same, we, we, we pay attention to the same uh, uh, standards in the dress code and everything. So when we were listening to Obama, more, far from the political spectrum, far from the economical spectrum, from, far from Barack Obama, Fidel Castro, and Raul Castro, we were listening to a message of hope because we are tired as young people in Cuba, we are so tired of this thing going on and going on and this speech and this hate speech. When I came here, I have this image of American mainstream media as one big, huge, bear who eat the, the children alive. It was like, oh my God, American media are awful. They present Cuba in such an awful way. And there was like, all the American journalists are really bad. And that's why we here in Cuba. And when I arrived here and I spent almost six months now with all these American journalists, they have done an incredible job. They have been fighting, they have been denouncing corruption, they have been denouncing uh, problems in public education, higher education. They have really hard life stories, as my life stories, as uh, every Cuban life story. So we were connecting from people to people. And that's what people to people mean to us. It's not just this core program uh, regarding to, to Cuba. So when we received this announcement from President Obama in December 17, we didn't know what it was going to be next. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't know what, what will happen with Cuba right now. But we receive a message of hope. We receive a message where you can trust that a future could be better. And that future depends now on us, the young people and all the people that are doing something to uh, improve the Cuban society right now. When we are talking about immigrants, I'm obsessed about immigrants because I think we need to rebuild the times with these people. And immigrants in Cuba doesn't have a voice. Cuban immigrants doesn't exist. They exist once a month or once a year when there is a meeting and then they came to the embassy, uh, to the office of interest of Cuba in Washington and it's like 20 or 25 immigrants and that's all. But this is the numbers of immigrants coming to United States from Cuba. Here you have the numbers of people crossing the border of Mexico. Here you have the number of people crossing the border of Canada. And here you have the number of rafters, of people coming in rafters in rafts and risking their life to come to America. So when I see these peaceful pictures of Havana, I'm trying to imagine a better future for my country and I'm trying to imagine what's going to happen next. First, I think the relationship with Cuba and America will open really good relationships and really good uh, and will improve at the economical level. I think this uh, increasing of money, of the amount of money that Cubans and even people from America can send to Cuba, Cuba will improve, will improve sorry, the uh, private businesses such as restaurants and private homes and bars and all of these places that people are setting up during the last couple of years. 
I think the contact between people to people will open the minds or the mind of the Cuban people. We will start caring more and more about questions like freedom of speech in Cuba, freedom of the press, freedom of association, and all of these civil rights. And most of all, I think this is a great time to rebuild a relationship on the base of respect, of mu mutual respect and trust, and not on the basis of a big country, a huge country, telling the small country what to do. Because I strongly believe that the future of, C of Cuba is and must be always in the hands of we, the Cuban people. So thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. A message of hope. Thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, we will have an opportunity now. We have microphones in the audience, and we would love to ask you to stand if you can and give us your first name and give us a question. And I see a hand over here. Thank you, Suzanne Hoff. Thank you for coming and giving us this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have friends who uh, came over from Cuba, fled Cuba at the time of the revolution. And we hear a great deal of criticism that really this is not going to improve the life lives of Cubans at all. There's still going to be many civil and you know, arrests and, and that sort of thing, just restrictions. But we don't hear from the Cubans themselves. You are the first one that I've heard from. Can you tell us more about what the Cubans want through this agreement and rapprochement? Thank you, thank you. That's a great question. When we are talking about civil rights in Cuba, it is really, really hard to deal with that. Because when you have a country which is doing so bad in the economical field, people care less about civil rights. So when you don't have food for your kids, when you don't have clothes, when you have to fight day by day to have a house, to have food, to have the more uh, in those things covered, then you start getting less for civil rights. I think that's huge in Cuba now. I think that's really, really bad. People, are, people doesn't know how much they need these rights because they are thinking how to overcome the day by day. In the case of the civil rights, it's like, or in the Constitution, for example, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is allowed if it's not against the revolution or against the socialism. So we have this Article 5 of the Constitution who actually is against the freedom of speech. That's how you have all this, that's how you see all this new coming over and over again of political opposition, mainly people being arrested. And they are playing now a quite different and really Machiavellic game. It's like what is called short detentions. You will see a lot of detentions on the day of human rights or any other day, and, it's, and they are detentions less than, uh, they are detained less than 72 hours. So if they keep them out of the street for 72 hours and then they release them, which is really bad and it's against all the, the human rights. In the case of political parties, the pluri, uh, pluripartidism or anything on pluralization, they don't allow. The only party allows the Communist Party by the law. And that reminds me about freedom of association. They say they are working now in a new law of association, how to, better, uh, uh, how to develop a better approach to association, the association rights, but nobody knows what are they doing? And for example, they were working on a telecommunication law. And yesterday, all the mainstream media all over the world replicate this news about Cuban have, uh, having a less, um, less uh, charging less for internet access at public spaces. First, it was 4.50 an hour in a public center. You don't have internet access at home. And now it's $5 for two hours, but everybody forgets that it was in the medium or in the middle of this big, huge event 
when they present the future of the telecommunication law in Cuba or the public policy regarding internet and communication technologies. And the first thing they said is that they need to protect the national security. So this, the, the, the decreasing of the, of the prices can be seen as a kind of a smoke to hide what, they are, what they, is being discussed re, right now, which is the, follow, the future of telecommunication technologies in Cuba. And let me put you an example to really understand how important is that for Cuban people. According to the law right now, for example, the resolution 127 from 2007 said that you, if you are accessing to internet for a public space or public center run by the state, you cannot have a web page on a free server, on all these servers that offer web page or blogs in the world. So according to our law, nobody here, nobody in Cuba now is allowed to have a blog. Nobody cares and everybody does. But when they want to sanction or when they want to fire one blogger or one journalist, they have the legal framework to do it. So when we are, when we are talking about association law, telecommunication law, communication law, whatever they are working on, we need to be really careful and we need to pay attention to that because that will give the legal framework for what is going to be next and if it's going to be repressive or if it's going to be a little bit uh, better. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it's like, it's complicated. <laughs> Let me, let me follow up with that uh, just a little bit. Should the United States be demanding things from the current Cuban government as a condition for restoring relations, or do you think this will come up from the Cuban people themselves? I think so, I think so. Actually, there was this uh, discussion on human rights. They were discussing about human rights during the conversation, the two days conversation, and they didn't agree in anything. So they said, we have been talking for two days and we, we have came up with some agreements on uh, how to deal with drugs, immigration, but we are, we are strongly disagreement, we have strongly disagreements on uh, human rights. And I think it's a good idea to let the pe Cuban people to figure out the way we are going to demand for more human rights in Cuba instead of coming from the United States. Because Cuba has a, so, uh, a nationalist history and you cannot um, erase that. So if it's coming, and it's coming, it's coming from the young people, it's coming for, from workers and from everywhere. But if it comes from the grassroots or from the Cuban people, it will feel more authentic. And the government will need or will have to address what citizens are as, as asking for. But the government doesn't have to listen to the government of the United States. So I think that's what I'm, I, I'm so interested in on these conversations being in a peaceful and respectful and not demanding from any other size um, perspective. We've, we've been hearing some good things about uh, Cuban health system and agriculture and could you comment on those? In the case of healthcare system, well, I mean we have been doing this really good. We have more than 400 doc Cuban doctors fighting Ebola in Sierra Leona. And we have a really a small and poor country. I think that's really, really impressive. We have universal and free healthcare system for everybody. It's not perfect. It's not great. It's not the best system you can have, but it's the one who allows us to have like really low mortality rates be, uh, between women, between all people, between kids, children. So I think in the case of the healthcare system, we have been doing a great job there. What is wrong about it? We have been starting exporting our doctors because we need the money. So uh, the doc, what, what is called professional service is the main source of income to Cuba right now. So we have been importing Cuban doctors to Brazil, Venezuela, Ecuador, Nicaragua, and all of these countries that are paying for them. And then we, we, are, we, we are facing the risk of dismantling a really good healthcare system in order to have access to uh, more money. And that could be really dangerous in the long, long term. In the case of the agricultural system, it's complicated 
in the first place, the agriculture, we, we import so much food. We import almost the 80% of our food, which is insane because we don't have snow, so we can, we can harvest all our food during the whole year. We don't need to import the food. And I think they have been trying to, for example, give more land to the people and have like a, another ag agricultural reform, like the 60s. And they have been trying to manage that, but nothing certain has come out of that. And, not, and as the experience of my grandpa, I, I can't talk about, about this because I have been living with him my, my whole life. They don't have, for example, all the seeds they need to harvest. They don't have all the support. My grandpa has does these two ways, which is like the coal, but a man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you call it. But they don't have like tractors or these uh, specific um, machinery, machines, to work on the, on the land. And they have to deal with them with really small productions and that can barely feed us. And we can sell, but not so much. So we need to work better on the agricultural system, far from, um, from giving people land and more land, because there is no infrastructure to support that right now. Hi, I'm Megan. Uh, my question, you mentioned Pope Francis's visit and his work with kind of working out relations between Cuba and other countries. But in January of 1998, Pope John Paul II went to Cuba. And this was a huge deal here in the United States. It had been a buildup in the media for a month that every night Tom Brokaw was on television and they were so excited. NBC sent a whole crew, sent their main people to Cuba to cover this. And then the Lewinsky scandal broke. And they all picked up and they left. And we never heard anything else about it. And do you think that in 1998, the government of Cuba would have been open to it had the U.S. population been watching that on the news and watching the Pope's visit on the news then? And there might have been more pressure then if the American people had been paying attention. Was Cuba ready for normalization of relations then? I think they have been working on that since a lot of years. I mean, I have read this book on Back Channel to Cuba, and almost every president has been working on this reestablishment of relationship, but always under these pressure conditions. And Cuba doesn't respond really good to pressure conditions. So I think what was important about the Pope Francis, uh, Pope John Paulo II visit to Cuba was like he said something really, really important. He said, Cuba most open to the world, and the world most open, most open to Cuba. And he meant it. And that was, that was incredibly, uh, an incredible change in the way Cuba sees the world. We start opening to tourism. We start opening to foreign investment. Now we have like a lot of Spanish and a lot of countries investing in, in Cuba. Not as much as we could, as we wish, but there are some people investing there. And I, th I think that was a good framework to a, good, a, a, a better approach with the uh, United States. But I don't know. I don't know what would have happened if, if there was another, another situation. I just, I just, I'm pretty sure that was really good for Cuba in the, uh, the visit of the Pope. I mean, he pressured. That was like when, when he said Cuba must open to the world, that was like, like a symbol. That was, a, that, was, that was another message of hope when he said that. And people start looking at Cuba in, the, in, in a different way. I think it, it takes a long time to rebuild a so broken relationship. We are not talking about something easy. There's so many things that happen. So it's, it takes a long time. And I think this was the better time. In 1998, Fidel Castro was in the power. Have you read what he said about Cuba and United States establishment of relationship? He said, I'm not against it but I don't support it. It's like, I don't trust in the United States. So I think in, two, in, in 1998, he was a really um, important figure in the country. And I don't think we could have an agreement with uh, Fidel, Fidel Castro in the power. Because it, it took it, the relationship with the United States as something really deeply personal. So it's like a personal bottle 
against capitalism, against imperialism, and then it's, it's hard to, to have an agreement. I think that's was, that, that perhaps was one main factor on that, on that time. Uh, hello, I'm Jacob. Um, so I'm curious, what's, as far as how expensive internet access over there is, how expensive is it compared to an average Cuban's income, and how would you compare uh, a Cuban's uh, incentive to have improved access to internet as compared to their access to more basic necessities such as food, uh, health care, and improved shelters? In the case of internet access, Cuba opened the internet access, or started opening the internet, started opening the internet access in 1996. Right now, according to the official statistics, we, we have it is like a 26% of internet penetration. What is the problem? The methodology, how they are counting how many people gets, gets, uh, get access to internet. They include, they include people with full access to internet, like everybody here have. They include people who have access to something called Cuban internet or in national intranet which is, yes, websites hosted in Cuba, which is not internet. <laughs> so, and they also count people who's, who has access to email. So if you guys have access just to email for Cuba, you have access to internet. That's your internet experience. So we don't really know. Nobody really knows. I know some media have been talking about 4%, 3%, 1%, but don't, nobody really knows what is the real internet access in Cuba because we don't have access to the uh, to trust trust sources. I mean, we cannot trust in this in these uh, sources. How expensive it is? They develop this social policy to distribute internet. So, if you are at the university level, or if you are a doctor working in the scientific uh, research you will have access to internet in your um, work center for free. So for example, at my university, all the students have access to internet. Internet that is really, really painfully slow. You cannot even imagine how slow it is. You can open a website in order to give you an idea. You can open a website, you can go to take a shower, and when you come back, it won't be open yet. So that's horrible. That's no internet or anything. That's slow net we, should call, we, we used to call it. And that's the internet access that the university students has. On the other hand, they have developed public centers to have access to give, give access to internet to other people. What is the problem with these public centers? They charge you $4.50 an hour. Now it's five dollars, two hours. You have two hours and five dollars, and the medium, medium income or the average income in Cuba is twenty-five dollars. So are you really, really? Twenty-five dollars a month. Yeah, a month, a month, and that is five dollars, two hours. So are you really going to check your email and check internet two hours? With your salary, really? No. People are going. People who go to check internet regularly is because they receive money from their family here in the United States, or because they have a huge, huge communication necessity. But nobody goes to a public center to start a blog to talk about the butterflies or the, how it is to live in to live in Cuba. I wouldn't do it. I have a blog because I have free internet access at my, at my university. But I cannot imagine running my blog and pay $5 a month, that's, that's crazy. So it is super, super, super expensive uh, right now. There's no internet allowed at home. They say it's because the infrastructure has not been developed, but when you have a country that in 1961 developed a huge, huge campaign of alphabetization to get everybody educated, everybody knows how to read and everybody knows how to write in less than two years, you say, you said, how can this country that this this not uh, cannot invest on infrastructure to give people what is considered the main alphabetization or main educa educational tool of the 21st century, which is internet? 
And in the other hand, I have been seeing that American companies, for example, they really, really, all they take is American companies, they really need a Cuba 101 course. And they really need it now. You heard the news about Netflix opening to Cuba. How insane is that? <laughs> I would love to talk to them and ask them, how many users do you have? How can you open a service in Cuba that relies on having credit cards? Cuban people have never seen a credit card other than in American movies. We don't have credit cards. We don't have debit cards. We have cash. That's all you have. So how are you supposed to pay for a service like Netflix? <laughs> and let's think, the families here in the United States will pay for that. OK, that's pretty. The last time I checked on Netflix, you need to have internet access <laughs> to watch a series. So how are you going to supposed to have access to House of Cards on Netflix in Cuba? That's impossible. I mean, it's, it's so pretty from then to open to Cuba. But I was like, hmm, I don't get it. It's really hard to get it. And the other way is like, this is the not hope message. The hopeful message is like, Teenagers, oh my God, God bless Cuban teenagers. They have been developed, they, have, they want, they really, really want to play in networks. They really want to play Call of Duty and all of these games where you need to be connected with each other. So they start buying laptops, buying computers, and they start to doing what is called mesh networks. And then you have a building with a lot of cables from house to house, and then you have all the teenagers connected. And they say, a building is not big enough. We need to connect the city. And there is something called internet that do that. But guess what? We, don't, we in Cuba doesn't have, don't have internet. So they figure out how to do it. And they start buying these modems to, in order to replicate the signal. So they have been developed what is called the street nets. And the street nets connect right now mostly all Havana. So, the Cuban teenagers are more efficient than our government, <laughs> which is amazing, which is amazing. And they are sharing, oh, Netflix, take note on that. They are sharing 2,000 series for free. So uh, Netflix has a really, really good competitor in Cuba. <laughs> and they have been sharing TV shows. And they have been sharing games. And there is a policy, because these teenagers are more, more, more than you can think smarter than you can think. They have a no politics, no religion policy. So the way they find to preserve, uh, they found to preserve against the government was like, we don't talk about policy, politics, and we don't talk about religion. This is just for playing. And the government has been watching them, but they don't know what to do. What to do when you have a bunch of teenagers in, in the whole city wanting to connect? They, they have been dismantled. Some of these mesh networks, but they take more arise. So they, they don't know how to deal. That's, that's the way it is now, um, the telecommunications in, in Cuba. And how, that's the, the way people uh, have access to, to information and to all the, the, the things that internet can provide. So when we start seeing cat videos from Cuba, we'll know you've broken through here. Right? <laughs> uh, another microphone. Yes, sir. I'll sit, yeah. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I wonder if, uh, if you could speak to the idea, um, these headlines that we see that, that, that read something like, Cuba is opening. And uh, by the way, I was in Cuba in 1995 for a month. I traveled illegally there and had one of the greatest... They are recording that. Pardon me? They are recording that. I see, yeah. Well, <laughs> they, they know. Um, and I am in the system with, with, uh, with immigration. And it, it has become actually a problem when I'm traveling. Um, but in the meantime, so on the subject of Cuba is, is opening, um, the first part of the question is, how can we go there? Um, and, and you may not know, but in the last couple of weeks, I've tried to figure that out. And I can't figure out a way to get into Cuba right now, legally, through the, through the states. Um, and the second part of that is, I wonder if you have a sense, um, if the Cuban people are... are um, possibly even afraid of the idea of Americans overrunning your country with capitalism and, and tourism. Um, that subject is real interesting to me. 
Thank, Thank you. you. That's, that's great questions to them. Uh, how can you go there? It's easier now. And with this weather, I will go. I will go right now. <laughs> we should take a flight right after the conference to Cuba. <laughs> I strongly recommend it. Uh, one of the measures that Obama announced was regarding that. I mean, for, first, uh, in order to go to Cuba, it's not free now for American people. You need to have to get a license. But what is considered to be a, not a general license, but a specific license, now all that activities, like people to people, for example, the people to people travels, are under the general license. So in order to go to Cuba now, you just have to find a reason to go there, and whatever reason that people to people contact. So in order to have access to the people to people, for example, program, you need, that's the worst, um, the bad news, you need to go through an agency. And there is a lot of agencies working here in the United States that take care of people who want to go there in a people to people uh, program. The people to people programs, they have like a schedule when you have to prove that you are going there not to be in the beach and drinking mojitos and smoking cigars. So you can do that, but you, can, you, you need to have like contact with Cuban people and know about economy or arts or music if you're going in, in one of those, of those programs. I strongly recommend you to look for that Look for Cuba, uh, uh, American agencies that are working on Cuban people to people travels. There are a lot. There are a lot. I have been looking at the Cuban educational program, for example. They take a lot of people to, to Cuba. They have travels expensive. They have more cheaper uh, ways to, to go to Cuba. But now it's easier because you don't need to apply to a specific license. And these, com these companies, they take care of everything for you. You don't have to uh, figure out how to, how to do that. And the second question was regarding, I'm sorry, I have. The, the, the tourists here can teach people about America. Absolutely. The day Obama announced the measures, uh, a lot of people in Cuba with, with access to internet, they start posting a list of American companies. And it was like, McDonald's, no way. <laughs> a Starbucks could be. Applebee's, oh yeah. So <laughs> people know. A lot of things about American companies, and they are really, really, they have this really, really specific taste on that. So yes, I think we are, we are afraid. I, I wouldn't like to see a Cuba, Cuba becoming like, like what it was for American companies before 1995. I would love to see companies of the United States investing in Cuba who are, for example, environmental responsible, who, who has been like working in a lot of social projects that has some meaning beyond uh, obtaining, uh, obtaining money. And I think all the Cuban people want to see that. I would like to see a Cuba with a Starbucks or a McDonald's in every block. I think, I, I, think, I mean, we have been avoiding that for, that for so many years, and it would be sad to have that in, in the case of Cuba. I think Europe is a good way to have United States investing on, on, on their countries in a really good and better way than bathing them with those or these big uh, companies. Could you explain about the increase in private ownership of things like restaurants? The, the, sorry? The increase in private ownership of things like restaurants? Okay, after the, thank you. After the economical reform during the two or three years ago, they open the private investment. I mean, people can invest in restaurants, taxis, private homes, what they call casas particulares, and all of that. They receive, it was this dual policy because they need to fire a lot of people that was employed in state-run enterprises or companies or, public, uh, or places, and they don't want to throw that people to the street because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So they say, we need to have more access to money. What gives you access to money? Taxes. We don't know the taxes way of life in Cuba. We don't have taxes in any, almost anything. Yes, the people who run private enterprises know what taxes mean. So when, we are, when they were opening this economy and doing all these economical reforms, they start with private restaurants, for example. And they receive a huge amount of people applying for that, for that kind of license. 
So people receive, for example, money from the United States, their families here, they were investing on their private businesses, and they are starting small restaurants. At the very beginning was a restaurant with just 10 chairs. You can just have 10 seats in the, in the restaurant. Then they increasing to 50, and you can hire people, which is against the Constitution, because our Constitution says there is no exploitation from people to people, I mean. You cannot hire a person if you are a private um, proprietary in, in Cuba according to the Constitution. But they are going to change the Constitution. So uh, in the case of these private ownerships, they began to increase. And what is really interesting about it is the way they are um, aggrupating or associating right now. Because they used to have all the workers in this thing called the um, Workers Central of Cuba. But when we have, you have private people, they don't care a lot about what the government wants you to do or what organization the, government's, the government wants you to stay. They care about other things, resolving how to import food, for example, for the restaurants. So they have become a pushing force in the case of, of Cuba. And they have gained a lot of attention from the United States, for example. They have a lot of programs to give them, empower them, and give them business abilities and all of that because there are now more than one million uh, people running, pri running private businesses in Cuba, which is a lot of people comparing to the, the people that are, are already working. Hi, my name is Celia. Um, it's really interesting to get firsthand the perception of how you know, those teenagers in buildings connecting and the restaurants and, but it seems to me like so far we've been listening about the perception and the state of mind of Cubans in uh, Havana in cities. And I was wondering what's the perception and state of mind of Cubans from more rural areas uh, to these changes? Well, I wasn't in Cuba in December 17. I wish I was, but I wasn't. I think in the case of these the things about teenagers in Havana, they are replicating the same in all the main cities in every province. I mean, you can see that network in Cienfuegos, for example, and in some other, other places. I think people in the rural areas are more concerning about economical, economic issues. I mean, they are concerning about the salaries, and where are they going to get the food, or where are they, where, where, where are they going to do to survive? How do they have, can build a better house? And all of these uh, issues, they, are, they have no the same uh, concerns that people located in the, in, the, in the main city, for example. But the amount of immigrants in the case of Cuba is fairly distributed among cities and rural areas. So the influence of the immigrants and the money send, sending back from the United States to Cuba is almost the same between cities and um, the, the rural areas. Not in that way in the case of race, for example. White people receive a lot, way more uh, remittances and money sending, send, sent back from the United States than people of color or any other, any other people, which is interesting in the case of when, when you're analyzing the, the immigration. I don't know exactly what are all the concerns of people in rural areas. I have been there, and I think they are mainly concerned about these economical issues, most of everything. Um, I'm wondering what the Cuban people themselves feel about Fidel and Raul Castro. How do they look on them? Well, tough question. People, Cuban people living in the island, they still have a lot of support. I mean, they still, I mean, for example, Fidel Castro is almost sacred in Cuba. And they have a lot of support, and people don't like to specifically criticize any of them. I think people are more willing to criticize Raul Castro, for example, than Fidel, uh, Fidel Castro. For most of the people on the, on the generation of my parents, and my grandparents specifically, they feel gratitude in terms of, for example, the education system, the healthcare system, the this, this diminution of the level of inequality in the case of before and after uh, 1959. Uh, but in the case of young people, it's interesting because you now see people more openly talking like, or criticizing them like in a completely honest 
way in public spaces. We, we, when, for those of you who have come to Cuba, you will say that people, when, when, we are, when people are talking against the government, they used to whisper. And when they, it's, it's funny because when they come to Miami, if they want to say anything regarding that, they still whisper. And some people say, why are you still whispering? <laughs> you don't need to whisper anymore. And people are so used to that that they're still doing it. And in the case of young people, what is interesting is that they are facing or they are engaging, engaging in a more open debate on Cuban uh, representatives and this historical generation, Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, and they are, they are willing to criticize them most than, than people from previous generation. But they still have a lot of support. At least that's what people publicly say. There, there is still, of course, the opposition who strongly uh, works on, against that. But when you look at the numbers of Cuban opposition, it's really low compared to other, other countries or even compared to the uh, Cuban population. Hi, my name is Tom. And I have a follow-up question to the one you just responded to. There will be a time when the Castros are gone. Would you perceive that there could be an opportunity uh, for some sort of, I guess, what I would call a renaissance in the Communist Party in Cuba? And or would there be an opportunity to change the law at that point and provide for some sort of alternative political party opportunities in Cuba? I think the, the Communist Party now, right now, is facing a huge crisis of credibility. When my mind was young, being part of the Communist Party was a huge honor. Everybody wants to be part of the Communist Party. Now you hardly find a young people who wants to be part of the Communist Party. And that's huge. That's a huge change. We are talking about a crisis on credibility and on the belief of the young people on this party as a way to support ideologically a better country. That's in the first place. In the second place, people are forming like grassroots organizations. No political organization, not just political organization, not just the political opposition, but forming groups interested in environment, on the, for example, LGBT movement. They are really strong in Cuba right now, pressuring on that kind of issues. And there are a lot of people who are forming these people interested in ICT, in internet in Cuba, increasing the internet access to in, in Cuba, people working on discrimination, racial discrimination, people working, for example, on religion. And I think all these groups will eventually will form a coalition that will, I don't know if it will become a political party, as you understand a political party, but I think they are really, really interesting uh, coalitions that, interesting groups that eventually will form a coalition and could present something really new and really different in the, that, that we have now in Cuba. And that's why it's so important, the new law of association. Because in, it, now all that groups are, are, are increasingly like separated because they don't know each other, they have not a legal framework to work, so it's really dispersed. But when this new association law came out, even if it's a bad one, people can fight against this, but it's something to talk about. And this, can, this could be the legal framework to in, in, introduce all this organization, grassroots organization, in the political landscape of Cuba right now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Elaine uh, was interviewed uh, on IPR, and you can go online and listen to that. She will be on the Ron Jolly Show tomorrow morning, and at 5.30 at Little Feet Restaurant on Front Street tomorrow, 5.30 in the afternoon, so you can get a drink, and then a little more informal setting, you can uh, ask the question that, that perhaps you didn't want to ask in this large room. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bob and Nancy Giles for arranging uh, the arrival of Elaine here, and I want to thank Elaine for a wonderful, wonderful thank opportunity. You. Thank you. Thank you for being here.